Hey everyone, welcome to the channel. This YouTube playlist is for all of the video recordings of the Android Study Guide app that I'm building over on Twitch. This is a project I started in July of 2020 to live stream building an Android app in real time. I just wanted to take my practices, things I've learned as an Android engineer, and share those with the community and give people a chance to ask questions in real time, learn about my practices, um, and really just build something as a community. Um, in addition, we're going to take that skill set and then build an Android app that we can actually use. We're going to build a study guide that will curate some of the best Android development resources so you could use that app to stay up to date. Um, now, at the time of making this video, we're not done, so if you want to follow along, make sure you check out my Twitch channel, which will be in the links below. Um, but I just wanted to give you this introduction. When I wrote the first, or when I saved the first stream video, uh, we had some issues with the file saving and it was kind of jumpy and it dropped a bunch of frames. So right after I'm done talking, we're just gonna dive straight into uh, video one. Um, and I'll probably just do that for all of the upcoming videos as well. If there is any important details, I'll make sure that I post them here. Um, but yeah, I hope you enjoy this. Use this place to keep up to date on videos if you miss the live stream, but check out the uh, video notes below for any relevant links or information. Thanks. I got this really great idea from Nate. Hi, Nate in chat. Uh, Nate gets credit for this really great idea of the app that we're going to build is like a little Android study guide. Uh, we can go on to build an app that can curate some top Android content, whether that's articles, videos, podcasts, um, books, anything that people can then go and learn about Android development from. So it's kind of got this dual purpose. We can learn how to build an app together, and then we can build an app that's actually going to help us out in the future. So I'm going to share the link to this repository in chat for all of you. Um, so you can go ahead and start this and follow this along. Um, and I put some info in the readme, uh, you know, about what this is. Um, one link that is really helpful in this readme, just to talk about that a little bit. So one of my concerns of trying to build an app uh, live on stream, right, is that um, things can move pretty fast. Maybe you need to step away for a minute and you don't always understand what's happening. Um, or some people are just nervous to ask their own questions. So with each stream, I'm going to set up a Slido link, which is like this Q&A platform. So if anyone has questions throughout the stream uh, about something that was said that they want me to answer, you can actually post these here. And I'll try to check this out uh, occasionally throughout the stream. Um, but of course, feel free to post in chat if you have questions too. Uh, hopefully this can be like a collaborative learning experience and we all can feel involved in working on the app. So does that sound good? Uh, does anyone have like initial questions about this idea um, I will talk in a second about like this process over time. Uh, it's not going to be as complicated as I made it sound up front, of course. But does that sound exciting? Hopefully it does. Um, yes. Great. The hardest thing about streaming on Twitch is I know there's like latency. So every time I ask a question, I have to like wait longer than I think I need to for you all to answer. So bear with me. That's going to make me like super self-conscious in the beginning, but I'll get used to that. Um, so my thought process on how to do this over time is each stream can sort of focus on something specific. So it's not going to be overloaded with like a lot of code or a lot of content. Um, that'll make it really easy to digest in real time. We can also take specific things and really dive deep into them when we isolate them from other stuff. And then it helps uh, reviewing these videos later to understand like these individual topics. So what I thought would actually be a really good first stream that doesn't get super technical is to talk about like some of the tooling I use for code quality in projects. So specifically, I'm gonna show you how I add something called KTLIN to the app, which is, um, a code formatting tool from Pinterest that will make sure your code matches up with the Kotlin style guide. We'll look at Detect, which is a static analysis tool to look for code smells in your app. And then I also want to look at like GitHub Actions as an option for um, 
doing uh, continuous integration of your app. So every time I push to uh, some branch or I make a pull request, uh, we can have a process that's going to automatically run and validate like that our code works. Um, so that's something really helpful to allow us to write code and ship code with confidence. Um, so I think that that first one, that GitHub Actions would be, even though it's not Android specific yet, that would be a cool thing to talk about first. Um, GitHub Actions is GitHub's like first party continuous integration um, tool. So you can see here when you go to the Actions tab of a GitHub repo, there's plenty of information about how to get started and even one for setting up a workflow yourself. So let's, I'm going to do that and see what that does because I actually haven't this is a little more complicated than I thought it was. Let me go back. And I'm going to show you a trick that... Oh, thank you for the host, Tristan. Uh, I'm going to show you a trick that every software engineer ever does, which is copy and pasting, right? Um, specifically with some of this initial project setup uh, that is kind of like a one and done thing, um, really what you end up doing is kind of just going back at previous projects, copying what that did, and moving on. So I'm going to open up real quick this other GitHub project I made a while ago, which was this little Pokédex app, which was meant to be another playground of trying some different things. But specifically, I'm going to go into this .github folder. So this is where you put any files that are specific to GitHub integrations. And then there's another folder for workflows. And I'm going to copy this Android build that YML file. And I'm just going to copy this over into uh, Android Studio real quick, but we will walk through it line by line. Actually, let's, yeah, let's do that. Let's go into Android Studio, go into our project directory. First, we'll make that new folder, that GitHub, and then we will make a new folder for workflows and then we will make one called android build.yml so let's talk about um, what this github workflow is going to do so first you give it a name and this name should just describe what that workflow is doing so when i say android build what i mean by this is i want to set up a workflow that's just going to build my project run my unit test make sure those basic operations still work. For a workflow, we give it some on keyword, which tells us like on what action this should perform. So here, I want this to run on every push. Uh, we could make this on a pull request. Um, I don't know any more options than that, but I would check out the work uh, GitHub Actions documentation if you want to learn more. But push and pull request are sort of the most common ones. Um, Push is helpful if you want to run on like every commit that you make, um, but maybe you only want to check before it goes into your production branch. So, you know, on pull request makes sense. You can also go, thanks for the docs, Tristan. Um, oh yeah, that's really great on webhooks. Um, and you can also make these uh, more conditional to say they only run on certain branches, for example. Um, Maybe we'll see this later in the streaming process, but when I think of more um, workflows that take longer, say like Android UI testing, those are things that might only run on specific branches or only run on pull requests just because they can take longer. Um, and I really only want to validate those like closer to the shipping process. And then these next two steps are kind of like boilerplate. You need to define any jobs that are going to run here so jobs is the whoops, jobs is the GitHub Actions keyword. This build can be whatever you want it to be, but I'm going to call this job build. We can say what environment that it runs on. So we're going to run this on Ubuntu. Um, I'm not sure. Nate, can you confirm? I believe these run essentially in like Docker containers or some kind of containers behind the scenes. Uh, hopefully, I'm right in saying that. Um, but I need to find all of the steps that need to be run for this action. So this first one uses actions checkout. 
uh, this is a built-in um, action, I guess, for GitHub Actions that will check out all of the code. And this at v1 is basically like the version of the checkout command I want to use. Um, the reason this is helpful is because if I write a workflow that works with this checkout action, but maybe GitHub on their end changes the way this behaves in the future, they can do that without breaking my workflow because they'll just introduce this at a new uh, version. Similarly, we'll have set another action to set up Java. Since Android is uh, runs on the JVM, we need to... Uh, I don't know if it installs them behind the scenes, but it basically gets the Java dependencies that we need, and we can specify what Java version we want. And then now we can put in our Android-specific commands. So uh, Gradle W assemble, all that's going to do is try to compile our Android app, um, and then the test command will run any unit tests we have. Um, this is a basic app. I just realized I didn't talk about this project that I have open right now. Um, but basically what I've done up to this point is I went into Android Studio, I clicked on new project, and I pushed it up to GitHub. So there's no like complicated work here yet. I mean, if you go into main activity, like there's literally nothing. Uh, so don't feel like I jumped too far into the process. Um, this is literally just created a new app with Android Studio's template, pushed it up to GitHub. I haven't changed anything else, but I figured uh, you guys didn't want to see me go through the setup wizard on stream, so I just skipped that step. Uh, so this workflow should pass, but we're going to add this now, and it'll be helpful as we add more tools and make our code changes moving forward to validate that. So let's go ahead and check out a new branch. Um, we'll say, call it GitHub Actions. And we will just go ahead and push that right up. Whoops. Actually, I want... Command K. I should do the screen highlighting tool where it shows you the keyboard shortcuts that I use. I'll try to call them out in the meantime. But uh, Command K, or probably Control K on PC, will open up this commit dialog. Um, and I can go ahead and put in my commit saying adding you know, build workflow. And go ahead and push that up to GitHub. So this is the first sort of Android tool that I like to use in all of my projects. And again, this is just about shipping with confidence. Um, you can do more complicated work with um, GitHub Actions or really any other continuous integration tool. You can go on to use it for running your UI test or running lint checks that we can look at later. Um, you can even update it for like publishing your app to the Play Store uh, automatically. And that's really like what these are made for, is to do things for you like automatically. That's what it means by continuous integration. So I can go ahead and make this pull request to add the branch that I just made. And what we should see happen in a second is that this workflow is already running. So I can make this code change. And if I am a super lazy developer who never checked if it compiled, um, I have this continuous process to do it for me. And then whoever I tell to review my code can merge it knowing that it's going to work out just fine. So hopefully, uh, I probably won't always wait for these to finish. Um, but if you haven't seen this before, you can click on the details to view information about this job. We can see the build we ran on the side. We get detailed information about you know which build is running. Um, we can see like the branch it was on, and then we can see the console output right here, so we can follow along at what's happening. I will use this moment briefly to check if there were any Slido questions, but it doesn't look like there are any yet. Cool. Um, and while we're looking at like GitHub Actions in particular here, a really great thing to keep in mind is this concept of continuous integration, and really like the usage of a YAML file to set up this continuous integration. Um, is something that's pretty standard across the in industry for different types of tools, different types of platforms. Um, so if you use, say, Jenkins or GitLab or BitRise or CircleCI, there are a lot of options. They all pretty much do the same thing of continuous integration. And the YAML file we looked at, the setup might be a little different. Um, but that concept, the benefits they brings us, is all the same. So 
I expected this to run a little faster because it's a new app that doesn't really have a lot going on. Um, but I might move on to the next topic. Um, oh, cool. Build successful. So now it's just going to run this test. Does anyone have any questions about this? Um, about the file I made? Cool, this is done. About the file I made, about um, continuous integration in general. Do I feel current CI solutions are lacking for mobile dev? In my experience, they're not. Um, most CI tools give you the bare minimum of some sort of container or Unix machine that allows you to uh, run whatever you need to, um, whether that's just building your app and running unit tests, um, publishing to the Play Store. Basically, if you can write a ter terminal command for it, uh, you can do it on some existing CI solutions. Um, one common, uh, is this a problem? One hiccup I found in my experience with CI tools is to do things like automated testing, uh, tests like UI tests that need to run on an actual emulator. That can always be a pain to set up because um, just creating an emulator from the command line is kind of tricky. And then you have to wait for the emulator to actually load up. This is really easy to do in Android Studio when I can just click on the emulator and hit start. Um, so in some CI solutions, I've had hiccups with that. With GitHub Actions, actually, uh, we can do a search for GitHub Actions emulator. There is like a, a emulator runner already for GitHub Actions. I can even post this link if you want to follow this. Um, but similar to our YAML files before, where we had like a just uses actions thing, um, we can do the same thing here with this runner, uh, where we can basically create a run test command. We say it uses the Android emulator runner, we give it an API level, and it does all the work for us. I have used this in the Pokédex app that I showed at the beginning, uh, so this is really nice um, compared to other CI tools where I've had to like write all the emulator commands by hand. Um, this is really helpful. Thanks for that question. That was a really good, good question. Um, but in general, other than, I would consider that like a difficulty and not really something CI solutions are lacking. Um, so now that we've got the workflow in, I'm just going to go ahead and squash and merge this real quick. And um, I'm going to go ahead and delete the branch once I'm done with it. That's more of a personal preference, but I like cleaning up the branches. So let's go back into um, our development branch, pull down the changes. All right, we're good to start on something else. So if there aren't any other questions from that, I guess the next uh, tool that I like to use that we can talk about is KTLint. Um, and this is personally like one of my favorite uh, tools to use. And let's pull that up. Um, so. I'll show you a couple pages real quick. So KT Lint is a tool built by Pinterest that um, is like a formatting tool for Kotlin. Uh, their tagline here is an anti-bike shedding Kotlin linter. So uh, if you've never heard of the term bike shedding before, uh, basically what this means is people spend time arguing over trivial things because they're easy to talk about, right? Uh, the example that you will hear about with bike shedding is people can be building like a nuclear power plant, this very complicated thing, but they will spend their time arguing over where to put the bike shed. But that's like the least important detail out of everything, right? And so similar code reviews can be the same way. If you're looking at a piece of code, it's easy to be like, oh, you have extra white space here. There's two lines between these things. Um, and like, yeah, that's important, but that's also not like the bulk of what my PR is doing. That's not what we need to spend our time talking about. So with KT Lint, you basically say your code has to abide by the Kotlin style guides. And so there's no more debates. Either the way your code is formatted is right or wrong. Uh, so it saves that banter. Um, it also has a built-in formatting tool that I can run manually to make sure my code is formatted. And then I don't even have to think about running it, which is really nice. So the next thing to keep in mind with KT Lint is um, 
you know, it's for Kotlin, whether it's used everywhere on Android or backend or whatever. So there's a Gradle plugin that I like to use, um, and I cannot pronounce this person's last name, unfortunately. Uh, but this is a KTLink Gradle plugin that is really common for Android. Um, and we can read these docs on their setup, but I'll actually go ahead and uh, walk through that process real quick. So we'll do some more of that um, classic Android copy and paste. So we're going to copy this class path dependency. Um, I'm going to go up real quick and get the version. So this plugin version is 9.2.1. So let's go back into our app. We'll go to the project level build.gradle file. By the way, um, please call me out if I forget to show you shortcuts, but if you uh, double shift in Android Studio, you press the shift key twice, it pulls up a file search window. So if you don't know where on the left-hand panel your um, file is located, or you're just too lazy to click in and expand all the folders, you can hit double shift and then you can start typing. So here I can type like main activity and it pulls that up. I can search for, you know, activity main and it helps me find that. So we'll go into build.gradle and of course there are two. There's the one for our app module and then this one with the dot means it's at the root level. That's for our project. So that's where we're going to go to define this plugin. And right here at this line where we have like the Kotlin class path, we're going to paste the line we stole from GitHub, plug in the version number 9.2.1, and we'll go ahead and sync that. So this will add the KTLink Gradle plug into our project. Almost. Um, it cannot find it. Ah. So this is another benefit of doing apps on live stream is I'm going to make mistakes like this and I can show you how to debug them. Um, something that you don't always get in like blog posts and other talks because as a content creator we've already skipped this part uh, but now I can't hide from the embarrassment welcome to it um, so one thing is that this code right here that we found from the github repo this basically tells us the maven repository that's hosting this plugin and um, Inside our build.gradle file, we have other repositories already defined. And so basically what this is saying is when I run a Gradle build and I need to pull in all of my dependencies, the Gradle build system will use these two repositories to try and find any dependencies that I have. Um, so this is Google's Maven repository. This is JCenter, which is a really popular um, package manager, I guess is that what you would call it, uh, for distributing tools. But occasionally you'll find tools that are hosted elsewhere. Um, so we can paste in this new Maven URL, which basically tells it to go to this website, and then it will try to find this plugin. So hopefully that sync will work now. Moment of truth. Cool. That looks like it's working. It's going to give me some other stuff. Awesome. So now that we've added this Gradle plugin, let's talk about how we can configure that. Um, so now I am going to go into my app level build that Gradle file for now. And again, this is all code that was auto-generated by the IDE. If someone does have questions about this file, like I'm happy to answer them, but you don't need to understand this code line by line. Um, most of it you could just leave as the defaults that Android Studio created for you. But one thing we do need to do is now that we've added the plugin to our project, we need to go into the module we want to use it hit apply plugin and here we can just do I'm gonna mess this up so I'm gonna copy and paste this again we can't just say apply plugin KT lint we've got to get the entire plugin name so we can apply this plugin and then the next thing we can do is I like to do these down at the bottom but really anywhere at the top level we can now create a new lambda for setting up KT lint and there's a lot of individual things you can set up inside this Lambda, uh, but to understand you know, what they do, again, let's go back to the documentation. Um, this documentation is, is pretty thorough, as you can see up at the top, but let's just jump down to this simple setup link that they have. 
Um, and go down a little further. I must have ah configuration. So this code block here tells you all of the things. I don't know how readable that is. Um, it's hard to tell in Twitch Studio, but all of the individual things you can set up in your ktlint file. So you can set like a version. You can set like if it should follow Android style guides. Let's bump it up. All right. Kotlin intensifies. Um, so inside this, you can see all of the different um, configurations you can set. Actually, and let's look at Groovy because that's what we're working with. So I won't talk about like all of these in great detail, um, but this is just ways you can configure the plugin. So like version is important because the very first link I showed you all was the KTLint tool from Pinterest. And now this Gradle plugin, you can think of like a Gradle wrapper around that tool. And basically what that means is you now have two things that are like developed in parallel potentially. So there could be improvements to KTLint from Pinterest that this Gradle plugin maintainer may not have caught up with yet. But the nice thing is I can specify a new version and it will pull down the correct KTLint version for me. So that allows like KT Lint to continue making changes and to move forward. Um, and as long as those changes don't break this plugin, I don't have to worry about updating this plugin specifically. Um, debug, I assume, just gives you like additional information. Um, one fun one is output color name. And the reason I call that fun is to brag is I added this to KT Lint um, because the original version of KT Lint by default, it outputted your error logs gray text color. And so when my build was failing because of formatting, it was really hard to figure out why, um, because the error messages didn't stand out to me. So I added this like output color name that will change the color of that output. So it screams at you if you have a formatting error, makes it easier to find. Um, so I'll actually just like copy, let's copy a, copy all of this and I'm going to take some of this out. Um, actually, let's just copy reporters. That's the biggest thing I want to get. Um, and this just defines the different like report outputs that I get from KT Lint. Um, the plain reporter basically means, um, oops, and we'll do output color name equals red. So these are just the two things that I need for now. Uh, we should probably specify the KT Lint version, but we'll leave that out for now. The reporters, I'll just talk about them briefly. So the plain reporter is just going to be basically text output in the console to tell me if there's any errors. Um, the check style reporter gives me the same errors, but it puts them in this special XML uh, check style format. And basically check style is kind of like a standard. So if you want other tools that can parse that check style re report and give you like I guess, detailed information about those errors, um, you can use that. So now that we've added this Gradle plugin and we've configured it inside our app module, one way we can use this is to go into our Gradle commands. Um, I unfortunately can't bump this up a ton. I don't think there's a way to... No. Oh god, I made this worse. I can move up the font size in Android Studio, but I don't know how easy it is to modify this right-hand window. Um, but what we'll get is we'll have three new Gradle commands for like KTLint format. Um, and I think there's a verification one uh, just called KTLint check. Um, the difference between all of these commands is basically KTLint check is going to run and say, is your code formatted? Are all of your... Cool. Thanks, Tristan are all of your Kotlin files formatted correctly. Um, KTLint format will do the same, but it will also try to autocorrect any errors that it has. So let's go ahead and start by looking at like just this check method and see if anything by default is wrong. Um, cool, it is actually. So let's bump up this terminal output. Um, and what this long line is telling us, if we scroll over to the right, is it's telling me this example instrumented test uh, .kt file 
um, has some errors. So one, the file must end with a new line, and it doesn't. Um, it says that imports must be in alphabetical order. Those look like they are. Oh, no, they're not. Um, it also says that you can't have wildcard imports. These are just um, official guidelines. Now, KTLint is somewhat configurable. If any of these bother me, I can go ahead and turn them off, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to try to uh, stick with their rules as much as possible. So now that we know what's wrong, the easiest solution to fixing this would be like KTLint format. Now, if we run this, um, you'll notice that it actually did rearrange my imports um, and put them in alphabetical order, but it's still errored because um, I have this wildcard import on assert, and this can't be autocorrected um, because KTLint just doesn't know like, what those actual imports are. You can't write a tool to fix that. So every once in a while we're going to find these things that require manual intervention. Um, now, what I like to do in this case is I will just delete that line, and then now I can go down to this. I can hit Option Enter, which will create uh, this import dialog, and then I can select the assert that I want to import. And now this should be good. There's no wildcard import. Um, a thing you might have to fight with in Android Studio around wildcard imports is by default, I think if you have like three or more imports from the same package name, it will convert to that dot star wildcard import. You can turn that off if we hit command comma going into our like project or IDE preferences. We could do a search for wildcard imports. No, Im oh god, imports. Um, is it in code style? Trying to find the Kotlin code style. Where is it? If we go into Kotlin code style, there is a tag for imports here. Um, and you can see it says, use import with star when at least five names used. So if there are five imports from the same package name, it's going to use the wildcard for us automatically. Um, but KTLint doesn't like that. So really what I'm going to do to get around that is I'm just going to set that to like really high. Set both of these to really high. 999. Nine. Oh. Um, oh god. What do I want? Oh. I guess I can't set it up to 999. But I can just change this to use single name import. And so basically this will never try to group them into wildcards. And then down here you can specify like exceptions. Um, I'm going to get rid of both of these just because if I leave them there, that will cause me issues in the future. Um, so that's really helpful to go into Android Studio and turn that off and make sure I won't be bit by that again in the future. Um, this can be really annoying for some people uh, because it requires that manual intervention. But the short answer about why linting tools don't like wildcard imports is because if I just have like this assert.star um, at the top, I don't really get a lot of information about like what this class is actually using. Um, and so it could just kind of be confusing and unclear versus by specifying everything that I'm actually using. Uh, there's no doubts at the top of the file like what my imports and dependencies are. So let's go ahead and run... Um, KTLint check again and see if our app is good now. It is not because um, I've got some issues inside first fragment uh, in main activity. Things like some unused imports, um, parameters should be on separate lines. Ah, this is a really good one. Um, so you can see the IDE accidentally put like the layout inflator param and the container view group param on the same line. They shouldn't be um, but rather than fix that ourselves, we're just going to double click on KTLint format and we're going to have it correct everything for me. Almost. Um, the only other thing, ah, so this example unit test class also has wildcard imports. Um, again, didn't do that on purpose. That's just the uh, Android template from Android Studio building these for me. Cool. So now our build's successful. 
So we now have like a code base that is successfully formatted, but how do we go and make sure that as we continue to do these live streams into the future, that our code base is going to stay this way? Well, we already have a tool for that in the GitHub Actions workflow that we already made. So we could make a separate workflow for quality checks if we wanted to, and I might do that later on in the project. Um, but for now, why don't we just go and make a new step inside this process? We'll call it lint checks. And then when we run, we can just do dot gradle w kt lint check. So that's the gradle command we're running to make sure our code was up to date. Um, let's go ahead and move to a new branch, add kt lint, and we are going to push that up, um, adding kt lint plugin. So I'm going to now kind of do that boilerplate that we talked about earlier and run over to GitHub real quick, make this pull request. But while I'm doing that, does anyone have questions about KTLint, about adding a Gradle plugin, um, anything like that? Oh, we can now zoom back out. <laughs> Um, if there aren't questions, I can talk about it a little more. So there's still an issue up to this point with like KTLint as part of our process, right? Is we added KTLint because we want, we added KTLint, we added CI because we want to manually, or we don't want to manually check the quality of our code base, right? Um, but actually with KTLint as we've had it now, we still kind of have to. Because what happens if I write some code that's not formatted right and I push this up? Um, the CI that we just added, this change to this YAML file, that will alert me that it's failed, um, but I will still have to come in, manually run this ktlint format command, and like push it back up. So there's still that manual intervention, and we don't really want that to happen. And one way we can work around that is with something called a git hook. Um, you can set up a hook with git to run some commands um, at some specified thing. So you could say, you know, before I commit or after I commit, uh, before I push, after I push, there's all sorts of things. So what if we could set up something to automatically say, whenever I make a commit, um, reformat my code for me so I don't even have to think about it. So the way we can do that is inside the root level of our project, we can go into the .git folder. And then in here, there's another folder called hooks. And if we do a ls, we can see what's in here. Um, but we can already see like there's samples for each thing. So let's uh, do vim pre-commit.sample. Um, this is basically a bash script inside of here that is just showing you like an example of something you could do pre-commit. I'm not 100% sure what this is doing. It looks like it's just kind of getting the git diff and then printing it out. We're going to get out of there. We don't need to worry about the details. Um, but let's create one of these. The way we do that is by creating a file that matches this format you see above without the dot sample. So if we want to pre-commit hook, we're just going to create a file called pre-commit. Um, and basically, all I want this commit to do is I just want it to run my ktlint format for me. So we can write the terminal command that we would run, which is just dot slash gradle w ktlint format. Um, sorry, if you're not familiar with vim, uh, it's basically like a terminal text editor. I rarely use this with some of these small files. Um, especially inside like the dot git folder, which is a hidden folder, it's sometimes easier to work through the terminal um, than it is through like a file explorer. Um, but so we're going to set this command inside the pre-commit file, and then we're going to write and save this. Hold on. Why aren't you? What did I do? There we go. I don't know what I did. Um, we're going to write and save this. And so now we have that. So let's let's see that pre-commit in action real quick. Yeah, 
Prince is going to roast me for that later. I can already tell. Um, so let's see that in action. Let's go back. We saw this, uh, this file was formatted wrong earlier because it had both of these properties on one line. So let's say I've accidentally done that in development um, and I completely forgot. So I'm going to be like, you know, um, adding first fragment or something. Like, this is the thing that I actually did. We're going to go ahead and commit and push that. It didn't work. Oh no. Um, uh, so let's check. I may have made the um, git hook wrong. So we're going to go back to that same process as earlier, and I'm going to look at a previous project where I know that this worked. Um, inside that Pokedex project I showed you, I had scripts and I had git hooks. Um, maybe I do need to... Hmm. Alright, I'm not 100% sure what I missed, but we are going to do... Because this is a little more complicated, this example. Let me just copy this and I'll explain. Um, so this particular get hook uh, that was lifted from a really helpful blog post uh, will basically go through my file and specifically it will look for uh, .kt files that have changed um, for this commit. That's what this line is doing. And if I haven't changed any kt files in this commit, it's going to return early. If I have, it's going to run ktlint format over those changed files. So the thought process behind this is just like, if I add ktlint later in a project and I only want it sort of applied to new files moving forward, that's what this will do. So if there are existing ktlint files that aren't up to, or existing kt files that aren't up to the standard, um, then this won't really change anything there. So let's go back into our thing. We'll do vim pre-commit. Um, we're going to delete this and paste in the new thing. I actually think what might be different is uh, this little comment at the beginning to specify that this is like a bash script. Um, that might be the thing that was required that I left out. Uh, so let's try that. So let's um, change something here. And let's go ahead and try and commit. And this time I'm just going to use the same commit message. I'll clean it up later. It's still not working. Weird. Um, all right. I don't know why that didn't work. Uh, I think I might have to do some research off stream and see. Do I need to make it executable? I do think I need to do that. Um, and how do I do that? Um, let me see if I can find this. chmod-x um, Let's try that out. Change something again. I'm going to back up and do this from the terminal to make it a little faster. So we'll do git add git commit Ah, let's see. Nope. It was not set as executable. What the heck am I missing? Um, let me also look at Pokedex Core. Let's Google it. We'll go to the Googles. Oh, plus X. God dang it. chmod plus X. Do we know if it's capital? Does it matter? We'll try this. Oh, no case. Okay. Oh, well, so now we can see that it ran because I got this no Kotlin staged files to print to the output. 
Um, but again, nothing had actually changed. So let's go ahead and remove like those things, clear the terminal. So now that we've made this change, we could say git add, git commit and updating fragment. And now you can see from the terminal, okay, it was running ktlin over this. Um, this means my commits are like a little slower because it might have to start up ktlin. Um, that's just true like sort of the first time. I think it keeps like uh, reusing the Gradle daemon if it's running. So if I make two commits, uh, the second time it will run faster. So not all of your commits are going to take that 30 seconds like that one did. Um, but now we can see before the commit, the file got reformatted. Thank you. Sorry for that. That's a really great note that I should add to the uh, notes in the readme after I send this up. So let's actually just go ahead and push this just because. Um, so yeah, that's really nice. Even if your commits do take a little longer now, like again, you're just now pushing code with confidence. You know that your code is always going to be formatted without having to think about it. Yeah, that's really good advice from Nate. So you could do this in a pre-push uh, scenario um, if you're if you do stuff like that. I tend to sometimes be the person where like every time I commit, I also just push, but uh, not always. So that can be helpful. Uh, something I might do in another stream when I revisit this, but um, the thing with these git hooks is like you have to install them manually, like I did. But there are like ways through Gradle that you can make it so basically anytime someone new checks out your project and builds it, you can install the git hooks for them. So as you add new people to your team, you can be sure that they're committing properly formatted code without having to do any legwork as well. Maybe we can look at that at another another stream. But cool. So are there any other I think that's everything I wanted to show off about uh KT Lint. Are there any other things that are there any questions anyone had about that before I move on to another tool? Whoops, we're in the wrong project. So I'll let this, I'll watch this one and let this uh, do its thing and just talk out loud before I move on to the next one. Because the next and probably the last tool I want to talk about on this stream is Detect. Um, we can pull up the page for that and I'll share the link real quick. So Detect with a KT at the end because every column tool in the world has to like slip in KT as a pun. Um, cool. So detect is a similar thing, but it's basically a status anal static analysis tool that will check for code smells. And what I mean by code smells are like, not necessarily code formatting, although that is something detect supports, but I always have trouble getting it working, so I didn't really dig into that right now. Um, but other things about your code that could be a problem. So it will look at like, if a class has too many lines. Um, if your class or your files or your methods get really large, that can be an indicator that you need to split up some code and it's not really manageable. So detect can set a threshold for that and alert you if that doesn't work. Um, if you have like a method that takes in like 10 different arguments, that's probably a sign that your method's doing too much and so detect will tell you that that's wrong. It will look for magic numbers. We can force a few of these errors just to see what it looks like. But that's the general idea of what detect does. Our KT lint build passed, so I'm just gonna merge this real quick. I don't know if you saw what I did when I merged the first PR, but in GitHub, where there's this merge button that you've probably all seen before, on this dropdown you have like a few different options. This first one, create a merge commit. Um, it's basically like, the git history doesn't look much different other than you see an actual commit saying like a merge happened. And if you're just looking at the git log, that causes some clutter because a merge commit doesn't really mean anything other than that. It's not like a code change. I like this squash and merge, which basically takes all of my commits into one and puts that on the base branch that I'm merging into. Um, I'll show you what that looks like in a second. 
And when I do that, GitHub automatically will like put all of the commit messages of all like however many commits I made. Um, so even though I'm taking several commits and I'm squashing them into one, if I have helpful commit messages, then nothing was actually lost here. Um, but similarly, because I used five commits to really only do one thing, I can modify this and get rid of all the extra fluff and say, this is what this commit is actually doing. So we'll squash and merge, and we'll delete the branch. Um, and so what basically that gets us is if we look at the commits for this branch, there's nothing in here that says, like, merge. These three commits are, like, in order the actual things that I did. So the good history is really easy to read that way. Um, that's just a personal preference, though. Maybe someone could tell me if there's, like, a helpful reason to keep merge commits around. But Cool. Doesn't seem like there were other questions than that. So let's talk about detect. This is another really cool one. Uh, first, we're going to go through the same process of doing some uh, digging for the plugin information. So that's the sort of plugin identifier and their current version is 1.10.0. So let's go back, actually let's pull to make sure I get the stuff I just merged and we'll check out a new branch for add detect. So let's go into our build.gradle file for the app again. So the detect tool is again another Gradle plugin. So we first need to go inside the project level build.gradle file. Go ahead and add class path that, what did I say, 1.10.0. Um, and I think this might be on Chase Center or the thing we've already used. So let's go ahead and sync. No. Um, oh, wait. I need to add detect. Gradle plugin, I think, to this. Yeah, that looks like it's working. Um, this one's taking a little longer. Cool. So, and then we'll see if we go over into our tasks now. Um, it's in verification, other. Somewhere we have some new detect related tasks. Um, I don't remember where they go. Where do they go? Let's see if we can run it from the command line. Make sure it was actually added. Detect stole your lunch money once? I would love to hear that story. Okay, detect was not found. Oh, probably because I'm missing. What am I missing? Do I need to apply the plugin first? Um, maybe I do. Let's try to use the old syntax, but let's copy this line and use the new, um, That's great. Uh, we'll use the new plugin syntax for this. I don't use this a whole lot, but I think this is... We'll just copy and paste the code and then I don't have to worry about it being wrong. Um, so let's go ahead and add that. So now do we have... the command. Let's... um. I think it shows up under verification. Yes. So now we can see we got some Gradle commands here for detect. Um, we'll talk about the three that are helpful here. So the first one, just detect by itself, is similar to the ktlint check. This will go and make sure that our code meets all of our um, thresholds of things we have to find. Uh, detect baseline is so imagine a world where um, some of you may already have existing Android apps that you work on, and you don't have Detect. And what's going to happen is you're going to add this to your project, and there's a good chance that it's going to raise a bunch of flags already, um, because you weren't enforcing this before, so you're going to have problems in your code base. And depending on how big the code base is, that's a lot of work to go back and fix all of those things. So what Detect Baseline will do is it will go through your project, 
find all of the existing errors, throw them in a baseline file, and then moving forward, detect can check against that baseline file and it won't yell at you for errors you already know about, basically. Um, and you could still go in like manually at a later date and fix those things, um, but basically saying you don't have to fail on them moving forward. And then detect generate config will generate a detect configuration file for us um, with all of the detect defaults that we can then go and modify. So let's do that and let's look at what that file looks like. So inside the root of our project, I'm going to just get add this real quick. Um, we got this new detect.yml file. This is a massive file, but this has all of the rules and rule sets that detect uh, has for us. And let's look at just the first one I think of is this long method rule. Um, so basically long method is saying that like a method that has more than X number of lines. Thank you for the two recent follows, by the way, Super Emily and Shriash. Um, this is basically saying if a method has more than 60 lines, um, we want to be notified. Now, you might have your own threshold for that. Maybe you want to say, well, actually, I think like 40 lines is reasonable. I can go ahead and change this. Or maybe I don't care about long methods at all. I can turn this to false. Detect is very, very highly configurable. Um, all of these rule sets, you can turn them on or off. Some of them have specific conditions. Like if we look at uh, too many functions, um, this is like a common one. You don't want your classes to be doing too much. You can literally specify a different threshold for functions in a file, functions in a class, functions in an interface, um, functions inside an enum. Uh, you can have it ignore deprecated functions in this count. Like, this is probably the most configurable um, rule set that I know of, but this is really helpful uh, to play around with. And especially for those of you who were in the bucket I just said of, you're adding the tech to an existing project. So like when I added this at my last job, uh, we found that we had a lot of classes that had more than 11 methods. And again, we didn't want to fix all of them, so we changed our threshold to like 15 or 20, or some number that was like in the middle. Um, for this project for now, we're just going to leave that at defaults, but I want to show you uh, what that means. And then we're going to run back to um, GitHub real quick, and I'm actually just going to copy all of the uh, defaults from GitHub. Basically, this will define all of the, similar to the configuration for KT Lin, we can configure individual stuff about um, detect. So, and I'll actually leave these comments in here for now. Uh, but this will basically um, configure the detect plugin however we want. Um, I'm actually going to remove the baseline because we don't do that in this project. I'm not worried about failing fast. Uh, we'll leave all the reports on if we want them. Um, and then I think this works out fine. We need to change this. I noticed this was a thing because the detect generate config command put that there. But let's sync this. Let's run detect to make sure that it works. Um, clear the terminal. So we'll run this. I think this is just the standard template project. Cool. So it didn't, didn't yell at me at all. Uh, so let me show you something that would fail on detect so you can understand. Um, let's say we want like to keep track of some like timestamp or something and we set this to like one two three. If I now go ahead and run detect this should fail? This didn't fail. Um, let's see why. There's one command in here called magic number. Why didn't that fail? Many declarations are no local view. Hmm. That should have failed on me. Um I think one thing I might need to do is move this detect config into the app module like I did with KT Lint. Let me go ahead and try that real quick. Um so I'm just gonna copy and paste all of that. Uh, we do need the apply plugin at the top for this too. 
Um, let's get that. So sorry, I'm just copying the plugin ID uh, that we used to import it, and then inside the application module, I'm adding that to our apply plugins block. So now let's sync this, see if this works. Um, one thing I will need to change now is because I have this configuration inside my app module and not the root project, I need to change this um, this to look at like the root project that project directory. And then we can look in slash config slash detect detect that YML. Let's try this out and see if we can get it to yell at us now. Cool. Alright, so now my build failed, and we can see the reason why is because we had a magic number. It even gives me the variable name, it tells me the file name and line number. I can click on it. And so, like this specific magic number rule is helpful because, like, this 123 means nothing to the people who read it. And so that's a code smell because the next person to inherit my app could have no idea what that means. So like just to talk out loud about what the solution would be is like we could create some constant and say, you know, um, animation timestamp. I don't know, I'm thinking of random names here. Equals one, two, three. So now we can set that to like this constant that I've defined. And now if I run detect, um, this will work. Cool, build successful. So that's that's a really, really powerful tool. I just like the magic number things is kind of like the tip of the iceberg. Um, it can record so much, um, but it really helps you just, some of those rules, even though they're configurable, it helps you become a better programmer in a way um, because it pushes ideas on you like, don't put too many lines in one file. Don't put too many like methods in a class. Don't put too many parameters on your methods. Um, it's really nice. So we're gonna add that to this project. So similar to KT Lin, as we move forward on streams, we'll make sure we're writing um, good code. And maybe we modify those rules along the way. If we find it's like too strict for us, we can always turn that off. And the last thing I do before I add this is I'm basically going to, um, I'm just going to add the detect command with the other lint checks. Um, Cause even though they're different things, I kind of like view them the same. Like lint checks to me is, is my code formatted right? Does it pass the code quality checks? Uh, so we're just going to add that there. So let's go ahead and push this up, adding detect plugin. And while that's up and running on GitHub, are there any questions about detect? Uh, I actually think for now that might be uh, might be the last tool I talk about in this stream because um, we've already been doing this for about an hour, um, and I know like I'm eager to dive into the ideas for building this app, but. I thought this was a really good first stream to just show like some of the tooling that I find really helpful and that's going to help us as we move forward in this process. Um, these tools like making sure your code is formatted, making sure that it, there are no code spells, um, making sure that every time you push to your Git repository uh, that your tests are passing. Like the sooner you add these to your projects, the better. So especially in like this endeavor where we know that and we're building something from scratch, uh, it makes sense that this was the first thing we added so that when we stream next time, uh, we can write that code and write it with confidence knowing all this was covered. Thank you so much, Nate. That I appreciate that a lot. Um, did all of you, I didn't check the slidey link. Um, I will look at that in a second. Um, I will repaste that. Where did I do that? I'm going to repaste the slidey link if any of you uh, didn't want to ask questions out loud. Um, but I did get a really good question I'm going to answer in one second after I make this pull request. Because um, it answers something relevant as well. Um, so someone asked a really good question about you know, how do you feel about preventing merging until status checks pass? Um, I am in favor of this idea uh, because like they're there for a reason. They're there to make sure that your code meets a certain standard, whatever that standard means to you, whether that's lint checks, whether that's um, does it build, does the unit test pass. 
uh, but they're there for a reason. So I don't think we should merge code um, until those pass. And I'll actually show you um, a way you can do that in GitHub uh, for those of you who do use GitHub. So inside the settings tab, I'll show you two quick tools for the settings tab actually. So I showed that I like to clean up uh, branches afterwards. There's somewhere in, hmm, is it not here? Somewhere in these settings, you can tell it to delete branches. Ah, so inside your main settings page, if you scroll down, there's this button, automatically delete head branches. So it's basically saying every time I merge a branch, just go ahead and delete the other branch because I'm not going to use it anymore. Um, notice there is still this gray thing. You can restore it. So if there is like a one-time scenario where you want to merge a branch but not actually delete it, um, that's still fine. But I'm going to turn this on by default because once I make a code change and once it's in the development branch, I don't really care about it anymore. Um, let's look at branches to answer this other question I got. So the question was, how do we feel about merging before CI finishes? Let's say we don't like that. Uh, we can go into the branches tab on the settings page of GitHub. I'll bump this up slightly, by the way. Um, we'll do that. So I went to settings, branches, and there's this list here of branch protection rules. So we're going to go ahead and add a rule. Um, we can set the pattern for like the branch name that this applies to. Um, I wonder if we leave this blank if it will apply to every. Let's find out. Um, but basically, we could set requirements before merging. So we can say we require someone to review this pull request before we allow to merge it. Um, or we can say we require status checks to pass. Now that's actually what I want here. So I'm going to turn this on and this will give me some additional options of requiring that it's up to date. So making sure, you know, if my feature branch is merging into development, it should have everything that's already on development. The justification for that is if two developers made changes that don't create a merge conflict, the code merges fine, but it's still technically possible they could break each other. Um, so that's one reason why you might want this. I'm going to turn that off here, but what I am going to do is say that that build uh, check that we run in GitHub Actions, I'm going to say this is required before I merge it. Um, and there's some other information here, like require signed commits. I'm not actually sure what that means. Um, linear history. So that would like prevent the merge conflicts we looked at earlier. I'm not going to turn these on. Um, but we can, you can dig more into these if you want to. So let's create, let's see if it works. Is this cool? Thank you. You all know my password is dot, 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 dot. Name can't be blank. Okay. So for now, uh, I can probably set a regex to apply this to every branch, but since for most of the stream we're going to be merging into the branch called development, uh, I'm going to have this rule apply to just that one for now. Uh, make sure, oops, this is the same, require status checks, build, create, cool. So now let's run back over that pull request real quick. Um, so this is already merged, but let's change something real quick. Let's do... Um, Let's change something, let's push this up, just so we can see what that blocked status check is going to look like. Dude. I'm glad that I'm doing this stream for other Android developers, because you will already understand the pain of our jobs, which is waiting all of the time. Um, so I don't have to feel bad when things take a while here. Uh, but now that we have a new thing running, you can see I've got all this red text and basically saying these status checks must pass before merging. Now I'm an administrator on the project, so if there's some some reason that I need to merge this anyways, um, I can do that. So what I did like that may not have been highlighted here is inside the branch protection rule. Um, there was the status checks that have existed for the project. And so if I had more than one, let's say I had a status check to actually run those UI tests on an emulator, like we talked about in the beginning. Um, those can be finicky, flaky, sometimes hard to work with. And I've always done the thing where like, those aren't the end all be all for me. 
So maybe I have a project that says, you know what, I want my project to build, I want the unit test to pass, I want the lint, lint checks to pass, but if the UI tests pass, I don't care, we can merge it anyways. Like, you'll have that granular freedom. The builds do provide us ample time for more Twitter. Yeah, if you guys think I tweet too much, it just really means I'm hard at work. That's how many Gradle builds I run throughout the day. Um, let's see if there's anything else. So I got another question in um, Slido, which is uh, a question I've gotten a lot, um, is <laughs> um, do you need both KT, Lint, and Detect? So when I first learned about these tools, I viewed them as two separate solutions. One was for formatting, one was for static analysis and code smells. It turns out inside the detect docs um, that there is, uh, let's find some here and here. There is like additional tasks for setting up formatting with detect. And I believe it's like another wrapper around KT Lin, the same tool. Um, so the technical answer is probably no, that detect covers both scenarios. I personally have not yet tried formatting with detect. Um, maybe we can do that on the next stream. Um, I did try to add it to something and had a little trouble getting it to work, but I'll spend some time over this week and see if we can look at it next week. So the technical answer is probably no, um, but I would say there's nothing wrong with having both if you wanted to, if that makes sense. Oops. Um, Is there a lint tool that could determine whether I could use certain Android X extensions to simplify my code? That's a really good question. And I don't know if that exists, but I'm going to record that question and I'm going to have an answer for the next stream. Cause that's a really good question. If the person who asked that question, um, wants to like DM me on Twitter or message me like privately so I know who you are so I can follow up, I'll try to. Uh, but I'm definitely gonna have to look at that question. Um, that's a really good one. Like Android Studio's linting automatically will tell you say if like you're using an Android X dependency that is like out of date, for example. Um, but I don't know if one will like automatically tell you like, hey, there's a library for this. Um, but that would be really helpful. Um, so we'll go back here. All right, the detect plugin passed, so let's go ahead and uh, merge that. And I will post the link to this project again one more time um, for all of you to have it. Um, but please star this, follow along. Uh, if you have ideas for the project, feel free to make like a GitHub issue or let me know on Twitter. Um, I think the first thing we'll do in next week's stream is start off building this study guide by showing how to show like a list of Android related articles on the screen. Um, I think it'll be UI focused. We'll just talk about like how to build a recycler view, um, get a list of articles, show them on the screen. Um, and then depending on like how fast we go through that, maybe I go into like actual networking to get those articles. Um, or maybe that'll be a third stream. We'll kind of see how it goes, but uh, I think this stream went really great. I'm glad you all found this helpful. I'm going to keep checking. I'm happy to stay chatting. Oh, it looks like there are new questions. Um, could KT Lint and Detect apply rules to layout files? I think the answer to that is no. Also, wait, I think I can. Cool, I can mark ones I've answered. Nice. Um, so, could KT Lint and Detect apply rules to layout files? I think the answer is no. I think they are Kotlin analysis tools because our layout files are xml uh, that won't apply um, but there is like a android lint tool that i didn't look at that will check like xml files for us so that will do things like if we're building an app and you know i align something to the start of the screen only it will say like you might want to bound this to the right side of the screen or something like um you do have the ability to write your own lint rules in android so if you have specific things in your layout files you want to check, uh, you can do that. Um, I don't know a ton about it, but I am always happy to follow up on these things, so if whoever asked that question wants to, uh, again, reach out to me, I'm happy to talk more about that. 
Um, I'm going to ignore the Jetpack Compose argument because I'm just not ready for declarative UI yet, but maybe one day I'll be on board. Um, but I bet when we do that, like, yeah, there will be detect or ktlet rules around composable functions. Um, and then the other one was, can you have multiple config files with detect? Um, I don't know if this is a technical limitation or not, um, but I don't know if there's a reason to have multiple config files with detect. Um, because within a project, you'd ideally have the same rules. Um, I suppose something you could consider just for like exploratory purposes, right, is we have an app module in our project and that's where we configure detect. Um, but some developers will work on a multi-module project. Maybe they take all of their networking code and they put that into a separate Android module. Well, you could have a different detect configuration there that uses a different config file. Um, so it's more of a like, technical rule could be yes. Yeah, Mocker has the same idea, different rules for different modules. For me personally, unless someone could tell me, I don't I don't necessarily know why I would or wouldn't do that. Um, but, I mean, maybe if networking requires a lot of code, maybe you have less strict, like, file size requirements there. Um, I'm just kind of grasping at potential ideas. So, I mean, it could be technically possible, but I don't know always that you would need to do that. Um, that's my only other question. So if there are any others in chat or in there, I'm happy to answer them. Um, you know, maybe this will be a Wednesday thing. I'm not really sure, but I'll keep you all posted. Make sure you follow so you can be updated when we go live. But I hope you all found that helpful. Thank you, and thank you for coming, Nate. I really appreciate it. Nate should have gotten more shoutouts in the stream than he did, um, because not only is he the one with this great idea, but everything I learned about GitHub Actions, I learned from Nate. Uh, if you don't follow other self-plug for me and for others, um, Async Android. If you don't subscribe to the Async Android YouTube channel, uh, you should go do that. This is a bunch of Android Google developer experts who are releasing some great Android content right now during quarantine since we are not having meetups and conferences. Um, somewhere in here is a video from Nate about GitHub Actions, I believe. Um, but there's plenty of other ones on here from us as well as uh, probably at least a dozen other GDEs, so if you're ever looking for Android content, uh, check it out. When we get to the stage of... Yeah, yeah great cross-promotion. Actually, when we get to... I imagine this will be later, like several streams from now, but when we get to the stage of like taking our study guide and showing Android related videos, uh, my plan is to learn about the YouTube API and see if I can take this channel and dump it into our study guide app. Um, just because I know this channel is like Android content. Um, so that's probably the easiest resource to get it from. So yeah, thank you guys again hang out for another minute or two, but don't mind the Coca-Cola product placement. All right. I think we're good. Thank you so much. That was a lot of fun. I'll see you guys next time.